Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Catholic Talk Show. Today, we're going to be asking the question, can Catholics smoke weed? <laughs> Pass that over here. Here you go. All right. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at what the church teaches on the use of illegal substances, and we're going to talk about the specific morality of marijuana use. Pass it over here. Good to be back in the studio with you guys. Great topic. I think a lot of uh, a lot of Catholics want to know the answer to this question, including myself. Sure, <laughs> sure. And and I think it's worthy to talk about because let's face it, we have been raised, especially our generation, in an addictive based culture. Mm -hmm. And when we have so much that we can kind of invest our energy in and our attention in, that draws us into an addictive tendency, whether it's binge watching, whether yeah. it's uh, alcohol or drugs, we live in a land of excess and that could be very problematic for the human person. Is there a, a path of moderation when it comes to these types of things that could benefit the human person? Or is it something that we should altogether avoid completely? Yeah, I think that's a great way of looking at it in terms of the parameters because you know there are so many things that are legal today, including marijuana in some states, where your your mind is altered, right? Like, I mean, it, everything from nicotine to alcohol to, um, you know, even binge watching or looking at your t telephone. Mm -hmm. So you have to look at this in terms of a moderate standpoint. Mm -hmm. Where in the middle is something okay? Um, I think that's a great way of framing this question. Yeah, you brought up a lot of issues in there that we want to unpack today. So there's the issue of, okay, is it moral? to smoke marijuana when it's illegal? Is it moral to smoke marijuana when it's legal in your state? Yeah. Is it the same as drinking alcohol, which is perfectly legal and even you know, oftentimes promoted? Um, and then what are some of the dangers and some of the benefits? Because there's medical benefits Absolutely. to marijuana, but then there's also detriments. So right. how do we look at this at a very, through a Catholic perspective, you know, and really get to the heart of the matter so that people can have an informed conscience, yeah. especially now when the use of weed is getting more and more accepted culturally and becoming legal in almost every state. And I would imagine within another 10 years, be legal literally everywhere. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, we won't get into it, but then there's also like the psychotherapy of, uh, I forget what it's called. It's like kind of like a mushroom cinnamon fill or something like that. Shrooms. Yeah, shrooms. Yeah. yeah. Psilocybin. <clears throat> and I talked to a doctor and he said, it's a valid way of, of, uh, caring for somebody in a certain situation. Microdosing shrooms. Yeah. yeah, a Catholic doctor that I talked to and I respect said that it's it is a valid way of dealing with. It. But again, we're t what we're talking what about here is moderation, legality, medical treatment. Medical so treatment. Like, uh, th these are all very very important things. And when you have a spiritual malady, mm -hmm. do we run to these uh, substances right. so that we can kind of numb the spiritual pain that we're going through, or are there other methods to yes. address those things? Um, you know, so, you know, we're talking about the mind, the heart, the body, the soul, and we've got to be able to isolate those so that we could focus in on how to treat them properly Outcomes. and what is them. Yeah. So there's a lot of dynamics yeah. here. And what I, what I appreciate what you shared, Sheil, is the sense of legality. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what is illegal could potentially be moral. Mm -hmm. What is illegal? what is legal can possibly be immoral. That's right. So, you know, the sense of abortion, objectively speaking, it is a objective moral evil, right. but it has been legalized in many respects. And, you know, even with respect to, you know, the, the promotion and the cultural reality of pornography, you know, that's a legal thing, mm -hmm. but is it moral? Well, objectively speaking, it's immoral. Mm -hmm. And does it provide a good to society? You know, you look at you look at TikTok. We were talking about um, the sense of an addictive culture. And we even have, you know, phones. They're like, your phone's blowing up over here. It's my weed dealer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but they're, they're just constantly beckoning to us and moving, lighting up, vibrating, ringing, and saying, look at me, be drawn into me so that you can focus in and disconnect from your 
experience right now and enter into this experience. And then you have apps like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, which, by the way, we're all on and you should follow us. But, yeah. you know, we TikTok, for example, you know, I was just watching an incredible video where it was it was pinpointing uh, TikTok programming in America being very, very different than programming in China and where we can be accustomed and cultured to focus in on things that are just completely base mm -hmm. dancing or music or just foolish videos. Dancing is base. No dancing. <laughs> well, and, and it's like we should dance as a culture, but that's not. Dancing, it, yeah. it evokes lust out, out of many, many people. Yeah. So, you know, and this can become addictive too. the the lust of the body, you know, so there's a lot to cover. We're going to be touching on weed primarily, but we're going to be touching on the addictive culture, generally speaking, because there's a lot to talk about. Well, I think like in most things, weed being a gateway to other drugs, weed is a gateway to other elements to talk about as far as addiction, morality, legality, and substance abuse. Yeah. So that's what we're going to try to do today. So I think a good place to start is with the catechism. Well, uh, I disagree. I honestly, I disagree. Oh, I you disagree. disagree with the catechism? Well, not that I, that that's where we should. So where we should start is you pushing the subscribe button and clicking the bell on YouTube right now. Where you should start is making sure that you're following us on iTunes, Spotify, and most definitely Podbean. I want you to light up that like button, take a big rip of that subscribe button, and then exhale and share it all over. To okay? everybody. That's what we're trying to do. We need pushers out there, okay? And you need to be our pusher take for our the show. Take our show, pass it around, man. Share it. <laughs> All right, now we can start with the catechism. Well, let's be honest. Is there anyone in this room who has not smoked weed? Howard. Howard? Howard hasn't smoked Look weed. Look at that. Okay, so only uh, Howard. He's given the, what is that? He, he didn't inhale. Oh, so he ate a brownie. So he's taking digestibles. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Digestibo. He's digestibles. Uh, were they magic brownies or... Yeah. <laughs> so Howard's eating some brownies. So everyone in this room is taking weed. So we're not trying to cast judgment. I mean, if yeah, you smoke no weed, way. No way. you know, this really is a moral question, and we've all done it and honestly have enjoyed it, right? Yeah. Yeah. We we have grown up in this culture, and, yeah. and, like, we haven't been, you know, foreigner or puritanical in that in any respect, but we do want to look at this honestly, yeah. right, and in have my, the conversation. Yeah, and in my life, a lot of a lot of brokenness that I had was from substance abuse and, Without and, a doubt. and coming to know Christ through the healing process of Amen. that. Yeah. Amen. I can say the times where I was most into weed, I had hair down in my you know, back and playing in a band smoking weed was the time I was furthest from the church. I mean, look at this yeah. picture right now. There you go. That's shield. I, was, I think I was high in that picture. <laughs> <laughs> most but, likely. You know, the catechism says, and this is the basis of this conversation, or the first thing we should cover, this is catechism 2291. The use of drugs inflicts very grave damage on human health and life. Their use, except on strictly therapeutic grounds, is a grave offense. Clandestine production of and trafficking in drugs are scandalous practices. They constitute direct cooperation in evil since they encourage people to practice gravely contrary to moral law. So the catechism is very clear that using recreational drugs are a grave, they, they inflict grave damage. Mm -hmm. But then... And then also alcohol. I mean, look, what's what's the difference between a little bit of weed and a little bit of, you know, beer or a glass of wine? Yeah. For most people's mind, not that much. But I think the the big differentiator is really what you're trying to what's the desired outcome of what you're doing, right? If you're having And then and then also like dependency. Like, you know, is this something that's like on your mind every day? You wake up, you know, instead of honoring God through prayer you know, the fruit of, of the use of such substance, like where, where, where is it leading you? Where is it leading your soul? Mm -hmm. Is it leading your soul to praise God? Is it leading your soul to peace in your heart that's given through the spirit? Like those types yeah. of things are mm -hmm. important too as well. Yeah. I mean, anything that alienates us from God, which then ruptures our relationship with him or alienates us from our neighbor, Really, it doesn't matter what it is, whether it's weed or whatever. So number one right there, I think, is the intentionality and its effect on the particular person because there's some people who handle substances wildly different than others. Mm -hmm. Some people can have wine. Other people, if they even are around wine, it'll awake their you know, alcoholic tendencies. Yeah. Some people can smoke weed and be fine. Other people can smoke weed and it becomes 
the yeah. defining characteristic of their life. That's right. You know, to, to give a shout out to That's Community right. Chinacolo, founded by Mother Elvira out of Italy, they have houses all over the world and, and treat some of the most extreme cases of addiction and substance abuse, uh, but even address uh, gluttonous problems of overeating and just an overall uh, poor and lack of stewardship over the body um, and the heart and the soul and the mind, the, you know, Mother, Mother Elvira has done a tremendous job establishing a behavioral therapy uh, program that's, that's rooted deeply in the spiritual practices of the faith. And I've worked with community for close to 20 years now and, and been a friend to community. Um, you know, with the way that we, the way that we support and form our brothers and sisters that enter into community for uh, living a more sober and spiritual life, you know, if if they even smoke a cigarette, just a cigarette it triggers so much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, so it's like yeah. we're we're on like a strict basis of yeah. that that daily routine and having solidarity and making sure that you're praying, making sure that you're doing your holy hour, your your rosary, your daily rosary, and you have your solidarity groups that you're checking in with on a weekly basis, yeah. and then we do our support group on on a, a monthly basis. So again, to your point, I mean, it's a very very serious issue, and when people have opioid addiction, mm-hmm. which is a, a thing that we definitely need to speak about as a culture, because sure. all of us have experienced that in in our families and in society and in our relationships. And it's a real it's problem. It's one of the greatest health crises in the world is opioid addiction. And particularly in America, I mean, I've known so many people in the last five years who've died from yeah, opioid and, addiction. And, and they're putting fentanyl in it. I had a friend of mine's son die tragically, bought a, I think, an Oxycontin or something like that. And it was a, it was fake. Mm-hmm. And somebody put fentanyl in there and he died. I just did a funeral not too long ago. And, and about every other couple of months, three, four months, I'm doing another one. I'm doing another one. And then growing up, I mean, you know, we, we both grew up in North, Northeast Florida. I'm sure it's the same thing in Cleveland. I had personally four friends die. Me too. You know, and 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 going to those funerals, especially tags, like I, you know, may God rest his soul, and and I loved him like a brother. He was a basketball player. He was in my sister's my sister's grade, and um, you know, going to his funeral at, at the Methodist Church, the local Methodist Church, and seeing people I grew up with all tweaking out in the funeral was one of the most heartbreaking oh. things that I've ever seen in my life. Because then it's just like a. It's a waiting line to be the next yeah. one in the casket. Yeah. You know? yeah. So we have on a societal <laughs> level and, and it's like we can't trust in the government to, to fix our problems here. Right. You know, like we we have to be on the local level and the grassroots level and a subsidiarity level. We've got to be a part of the solution. And, and hopefully this conversation will help kind of, s- you know, set that into motion with our community and, and really try to structure a response. Yeah. And even take it down to the most personal level of oneself. Right. Yeah. And really looking That's at how, Amen. how you respond Amen. to it. Because so true. for some people, alcohol is harmless. For some people, weed is harmless. And for other people, it's tremendously detrimental. Yes. So really knowing yourself, right? Um, and, and, maybe, and also knowing family history, knowing the people around you, and knowing where that this could lead for you. Look, mm-hmm. for some people, you know... Taking a taking a little edible or whatever is a relaxing thing. It helps them read and focus. For other people, it becomes a crutch. It becomes right. something that they use to escape. They use to dull right. their their senses and dull That's their right. intellect. And like Thomas Aquinas says, anything that darkens our intellect is separating us from God. That's mm-hmm. right. And so, he relates it to sin. Yeah, absolutely. So even if it's not grave in the sense of the catechetical point, right. it, it still nonetheless has a maybe even a venial uh, component to it. But the catechism is very clear about gravity as it relates absolutely. to substance very abuse. grave. Um, so then let's talk kind of about the... There's some different aspects of the morality of marijuana. Number one, and first and foremost... And I'm usually not the kind of person who gives the primacy of conscience as a place to determine the morality of a thing. But I think for alcohol and marijuana, that is a really good example when the primacy of a person's personal conscience, well-formed conscience, really does have a big dictate in its usage. Mm -hmm. Um, But let's look at the morality of when marijuana is legal, okay, or any drug. How do you determine if taking a drug or, or any therapeutic medication is something that's morally licit. And there's there's three basic principles for that, okay? Uh, the first principle is, do you have a genuine condition? Is there something genuine? Because, like, I know a lot of people who are like, they have perfect vision and they've got a marijuana card for glaucoma. Okay. 
you know, they're perfectly cool, but then they say, well, I need, I have anxiety, so I get a marijuana card. You just take whatever you can and, uh, you know, find a reason to be able to get legal weed. I got glaucoma. I got, look at these eyes. <laughs> look at these eyes. Can't see a darn thing. Oh, that's a beep and a yep. dollar. Dollar in the dollar. kitty. That's in the swear jar. Kyle, beep that. Um, but then there's also, okay, so do you have a legitimate issue that needs therapeutic treatment? Okay, that's the first premise. Second premise is, will this treatment effectively address it? Okay, so a lot right. of people, you know, they... They get a card and they just get high. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's yeah. essentially the, you know, the process. But it could even be using the marijuana card, which it can um, be a legitimate thing. So maybe you do have a lot of pain. Right, you're in pain, or you have anxiety, or some other legitimate reason to smoke weed. Mm -hmm. But is the weed effectively addressing it? And that is that the intention to address it, or is right. it kind of a a dulling of the senses to avoid the pain and not address it? Right. So that's the second premise: is is this medication or treatment effectively addressing it? And then the third is: is there a better alternative that's either less expensive, mm -hmm. has less side effects? Mm -hmm. um, that will treat it as well because sometimes, again, you know, maybe for someone su suffering with anxiety, marijuana helps them. Right. Okay, so they have a legitimate reason. Mm -hmm. It's a legitimate yeah. uh, uh, therapeutic route. But is there something better? Maybe therapy. Maybe um, right. maybe other medications that have less side effects or less uh, darkening of the intellect. So those are the three right. premises to understand the the morality of any substance, sure. right? Yeah, and, and, you know, you look at this kind of going back to the legality of it, um, the Colorado <clears throat> Division of Criminal Justice published a report on the impacts of ma marijuana legalization in, in Colorado, um, and the total number of arrests decreased from 68%, you know, for seven years, but that's because it was legal. Yeah. But you look in here on, you know, traffic sa safety, like people, like DUIs driving under the influence increased... 300%. 300%. Yeah. So, I mean, w what you're doing by legalizing that in that sense is, yeah, you're reducing the amount of, of arrest and mm -hmm. certain things like that, which is great. It puts a big strain on the, the government, but you're increasing, but by legalizing it, you're increasing the amount of DUIs. Mm -hmm. What what does that tell you? It tells me that most of most of it's recreational. Yeah, it, well, and it it's, is. And it's being abused. Yeah. Mm -hmm. in, 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 you know, reports like that. So, you know, and, and just responding and caring for people that come out of surgery and, you know, like controlled medications and pain management uh, medications, you know, some, some of our brothers and sisters out there are, are experiencing chronic and extreme mm -hmm. pain. Yeah. So, you know, the, the necessary um, treatment plan gives a controlled sense of substance. But even within that controlled sense, how many people have the discipline to just say, you know what, I I don't need the pain pill today. I can I can do, or is it just like it's a part of having your blood pressure medication? Yeah. And and the scary thing about the generalized pain medication treatments, they when especially when they're opioid based, they and and a greater majority of the others, they're highly 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 addictive. Mm -hmm. But most recently, there there's been some development of non addictive. And analgesic, I think I, I hopefully I said that correctly. Um, painkillers, non-opioid painkillers. That's like like a like aspirin, right? That's like the same basis, I believe. I, I believe it is. Yeah. You know, they have some of the uh, the expressions here. I'm not even going to butcher them. Yeah. But um, but you know, like th this is precisely where society needs to move in the direction of. And we need to invest energy, resources, because we need to have a greater consideration of humanity as a whole. Mm -hmm. And again, it's like the government's not going to do that. Right. You know, like and, and there's just neither all are of companies. these companies. Neither are companies oh, going to yeah, do that. Companies are going to be driving addictive. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and it's, that's in every form of industry. Right. Yeah. We, you know, we had a, a conversation about Amazon, too. It's like they, they want their their users mm -hmm. <laughs> to be on their platform. Constantly. Constantly. And continue to come back. I mean, that is, you know, the best customer is your returning customer. And if they're addicted, even better. Right. Yes. So, I mean, that's the 
that's the first inclination of every business. And there are people, I read a report uh, about a year ago, there are people that are addicted to the number of boxes that they receive 100%. every day. Yeah. They have to receive, it's almost like Christmas. Well, it's, it's like a the, dopamine uh, release. It is. It is. I got, it's Pavlov's, I got you know, like that. Yeah. Ding. Yeah, <laughs> but then again, even funny. that, even that is a dulling of the senses. It's like, look, I'm not addressing something deeper in myself, right. or I'm not living a life that's really giving me the proper mental stimulation. So I could just do this very cheap, easy thing that releases dopamine, the, yeah. the thrill of getting something, and that becomes a that becomes a drug. You know, even a self produced. Um, you know, chemical that your body is producing through stimulus. Right. And the thing is, is like we were, we're made for so much more. Amen. Right. Like our, <laughs> like we were created in the image of God to share in a deep and profound and abiding love. Mm -hmm. Right. And so you have to look at these addictions, not as like, well, what else am I going to do? It's just like, no, you were actually made for something better yes. to, to look upon these and things. More. Yeah. To look upon these things through the grace of God, through mm -hmm. the lens of, yeah. of the Holy Spirit, to see them as they are, right? Isn't it something that we we experience very early on in our life, you know, God willing, is that, you know, it's through suffering through things that we achieve. It's, it's, it's through the pain. It's through the ripping of muscles, through exercise that our bodies respond and we grow stronger. It's, it's through the ascetical life of entering into a season of Lent for us Catholics, you know, where we, where we austerely treat our bodies so that we can enter more deeply into the spiritual life and come to a new beginning and a new becoming at Easter and, and grow in faith, hope, and love. So Throughout all of these things, you know, the dulling of the senses clearly becomes an objective point of consideration that this may not be good for my path and the best thing for me. What is the best thing? Can I be governed by the best because I have an appetite for more? I may not believe in myself and I, I'll never be able to get there. Therefore, I give up. Well, you know, God God is calling you individually, uniquely, not in the context of all these other people, your older brother, your older sister just does everything just so well. He's calling you personally to achieve the things that you have the capacity for and to enjoy that and not let anybody obstruct that enjoyment. Yeah, Benedict the Sixteenth said it perfectly. He said, you were not made for comfort. You were made for greatness. Amen. You know? Yeah, it's like uh, you ever see like uh, <clears throat> Fringe, all these things, there's like a parallel universe and stuff like that, and people mm. are bouncing in. It's like I, I <clears throat> literally when I practice austere, you know, practices like during Lent or whatever, I, I sense like this otherworldliness yes. of – are my my being mm -hmm. right? I I can sense like living in another world. Mm -hmm. That's you know deep, I mean? man. Yeah, bro. <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> man. Yeah, I'm telling you, bro. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, but I need you juice, man. <laughs> I worked my ten thousand dollars. <laughs> 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 you got to go to the big check department, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. But no, you're right. I mean, your activities really do influence your perspective on the world or even just your intentions and your orientation towards towards, towards um, your intentions. Right. Yeah. Um, it's it's helps determine your goals and your activities. You know, mm -hmm. again, it's that orientation towards the good. Now, let's talk a little bit about the legality. So. Is marijuana moral and illicit if it's illegal? I think it's a very clear case that it's not. Mm -hmm. If there is legitimate legal and uh, governmental authority, the catechism, the church, and all the tradition of the church says you are bound to that for the common good of society because God has instilled within human nature the need and the right for government. So if marijuana is illegal in your state, there's really nothing in Catholicism that says it's still okay to use unless there's a caveat or an exemption for medicinal use. Mm -hmm. So recreational weed, if it's illegal, I don't think there's a way around it to say that it's okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, because you are more bound. It's, I mean, you could even relate that to speeding. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> At the end of the day, the the decriminalization process, that you get the same fine for speeding, yep. right, if you get caught with it, you mm -hmm. know. Where it used to be jail time or you know whatever, but, mm -hmm. but yeah, it's 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 uh, it's speed. It's the same thing as doing anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I mean, you're duty bound to it. But so what if it's legal? So what if it's legal in your state? That's where the morality of this, and this is where our country's really going. Um, then 
I think you really brought up the point that there's a lot of things that are legal by the secular law that are not legal uh, by the moral law. And that's where we really get into kind of the analysis of its, um, you know, its effect on you as a person. Uh, again, and I, I think I'll keep going back to this, that it really does seem to me a very particular um, discernment. And I, I, and I always hear the argument, alcohol is very much similar. And I would even say that alcohol has caused much more detriment to society than marijuana. Tons. Way more. Mm -hmm. Oh, without a doubt. Alcohol has ruined generations of families mm -hmm. and so yeah. many people have thrown their life away 100%. on it because it's a very destructive substance. Yeah. yeah. Much more so than marijuana. Yeah. Okay, but there isn't the same kind of taboo around alcohol as around, you know, Marijuana. That jazz cabbage, right? Mm -hmm. Well, and the, and the other thing, too, which you look at, um, being in the the generation that we're all in, you, you know, you saw it being, like, strictly, you know, people are opposed to it. And then as we got older, you know, it became more commonplace. And then medicinal uh, uh, versions of it have helped some of the most suffering people uh, sure. uh, in our society with – um, seizures with autism and, and just Cancer the friction, patients. right. And just the friction of that, just to be able to get through that from the generational, uh, perspective on it was a, a long battle and a long fight mm -hmm. for that to happen. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and you know, look at prohibition with, with alcohol, you know, so I think generationally, and then you look at strains of marijuana now and how they've improved, you know, on the growing and certain things like that. Does it take away abuse? Doesn't take away all the things that we're saying, but it does kind of show that there is a benefit. Mm -hmm. There is a, a objective benefit for some people taking certain uh, strains of it. Yeah, I think a good thing to look at is, again, I always try to go to the catechism first. Um, and catechism 2290, I think, really kind of gives a good guideline for marijuana, whether it's these new strains are coming up of the indica yeah. or whatever, yeah, whatever. You know, yeah. he yeah. says this is a very good uh, catechetical yeah. what, point. What is, what is this one? The virtue of temperance disposes us to avoid every kind of excess, the abuse of food, alcohol, tobacco, or medicine. Those incur grave guilt who, by drunkenness or a love of speed, endanger their own and others' safety on the road, at sea, or in the air. You know, I think a, a good point is, is like temperance. Like what is, what is temperance for? The, the catechetical point that, that this is, you know, making is, you know, we should, we should be avoiding excesses of every kind because it's really detrimental to what the object of our desire is, is moving toward. Yeah. So what is temperance is the key question here. And why would I ever be temperate in a world of all these goods? Like, why would I strive after that virtue? So the catechism from 1809 expresses temperance is defined by the Catholic, the catechism of the Catholic church as the moral virtue that moderates the attraction of pleasures balanced in the use of the created goods. That's so a good point. it's it's a super important point. And why do we balance it? Because really our hearts are only going to find rest and complete enjoyment and that holistic sense of I belong, I have purpose, I have mission, I am content in this world where there's death around me, I know my path, and I'm secure in my identity. We're only going to find that in God. No. Yeah. St. Augustine says it simply, our hearts only find rest in God, right? right. Like our hearts find rest in, in that sense of moving our eyes away from the created goods of the world to our creator. And St. John Paul II explained that the essence of sin is when our eyes move away from our creator to what he has created. So there is a sense of moral components in this mm -hmm. when we begin to root ourselves so deeply and habitually in the world and living in excesses and making these living goods our, our living gods. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and it's like the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> you know, you, you're through temperance, you're taught to master those things, mm. right? So, so you can't master them on your own. You have to master them Amen. in the spirit. Amen. And, and when you, ma when you are the master of those Excellent things, point. Right now, you know that you're you're in union with God because yes. God is the master. Yes, you know a practical kind of takeaway from this is like, what is your intention? 
Yeah. Right? What is your intention of having a glass of wine? Right. What is your intention of, of taking a gummy? What is your intention of taking shrooms, right? Yeah. What's the intention? Because the intentionality really does dictate a lot of the morality of it. So and then when you take that glass of wine, mm -hmm. it dulls sensibilities. Sure. Right? And then do you have the ability intellectually and have the moral navigational uh, ability to then say, Fortitude. what is the intention of taking this second glass? Yeah. Right. Then what is the intention of taking the third glass? Yeah. Then what is the intention when I take this bottle to the head? <laughs> you know, like all of these things, like, you know, they, they sit there and create like a eroding sense of the intellectual it ability does. of temperance. You know, as the, as the decision gets harder, yeah. as the decision gets harder, your ability to make the decision gets yeah. less. Yeah. That's why I love the moderate motto of, of our boy Fulton Sheen, you know, we're still praying that he becomes a canonized saint in our church. But, you know, Fulton J. Sheen expressed, you know, the first one, what is it? It was like the first, first one's, one's for, for Jesus. First, first one's, one's for, for you, you. Second one's, one's for, for God. Me. And the third one's for the devil. Yeah. 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 I love that. Yeah. You know, so it's like he had a moderate motto yeah. that he lived by. So even when he was in that second one that he was allegedly doing it for God, I, for, yeah. I forget the order. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, he's doing it for God. Well, it's like after I do it for God, I'm done. Yeah. yeah. You know? And I, I think having that type of approach could be helpful, but even for me, like socially speaking, when I'm when I'm in my dry periods or I'm I'm trying to enter more deeply into the ascetical life, which is so important for me, and I'm actually considering living a sober life for the rest of my life because it's just so good for me. Yeah. Um, like I'm I'm having a Pellegrino with some limes, bro, and I'm like, or I'm having a mocktail, and I'm as just as happy as can be, and just as social, and just as social. Like right. I'm great, yeah. and you know what? I don't want to hang out with you till two, three o'clock in the morning, feel like crap tomorrow. So I'll see y'all later. I love you, but I'll see you, you later. Pass out on the couch and run. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't hanging out at two thirty. No, no. But uh, you know that really is the point. Like, what are you trying to achieve here, and can it be achieved? And it goes back to that therapeutic. <clears throat> what are you trying to achieve and can it be achieved by a better means? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, God made us with the intellect. He made grapes and he made grains to be able yeah. to make beer and we, we should be thankful for it. Consecrate wine. On yeah, the absolutely. Yeah. So there is some benefits to the effect of alcohol or even marijuana to where it um, allows us to either be more social or to really more see, fully... See, I question the marijuana part of it. I, I can see... The alcohol part of it, especially when it's like a small portion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When what about a small portion of marijuana? Though? But that's that's the thing. It's like the the consuming shift of the effect of it, even when it's taken in small amounts, can shift the mind completely, and. And that that effect, even even if one was able to drive or operate heavy machinery or you know be able to go out and socialize, and maybe now I become a social butterfly, and now I'm like you know, but I'm I'm introverted and I, I suffer with anxiety, and this helps me overcome that. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of people that that turn to to marijuana for those purposes, but like that shift mm -hmm. is the concern that I have because it is such a marked shift. It, it is it is a very clear change. And and I'm saying that one from my interaction with people, but also from my own experience. Yeah. And again, I think it goes back to that knowing yourself and knowing right. how it affects you. Um, yeah, there's lots of people that I've talked to that said, I tried weed. It's awful for me. I'm done with it. Yeah. You know, and, but again, let's just be realistic that the majority of people who smoke recreational marijuana, their goal is to get high. Does they're, it? they're trying to get stoned, right? Yeah, that's right. And we've covered that 100%. and what, what that means yeah. on a moral level. 100%. But, but, you know, like I do, like I will, I will still question it because are there other things that are going to move you in a better direction with more discipline and more suffering and more, more yeah. of that strain of, of, you know, pushing, or do I take a pill and now I'm going to lose all of my, all of my body weight, right. mm -hmm. you know, and, and introduce a chemical that may have a side effect that may do something even worse for me. So then what about maybe a situation? So certainly let's say that there is better alternatives to become more sociable or to celebrate than either wine or, you know, taking a hit when a joint's passed around. 
But is there a, a mitigating factor to the camaraderie? So if you are just passing around a joint and you take a hit of it, and then you do fully enter in and in celebration or brotherhood or friendship with other people, is that moral good of deepening a relationship outweighed by the shift of the effect of the drug? Because alcohol has the same it, effect. <laughs> yeah, it, it always goes, in my opinion, it always goes back to the intention, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> like there's uh, guys that I know that are Catholic that take marijuana gummies at night uh, with their families. They have big families and they're saying, hey, like I'm way more calm. I don't get excited. I'm able to enter into, you know, uh, more meaningful conversations with my children, you know, and, and, and I'm not distracted. And they're, and they're giving gummies to the children too? No. <laughs> <laughs> no oh, that was my, uh, yeah. that's that was my he, person. So that yeah. would be terrible. So why would it be terrible for the children, but okay for older children? Well, I think it becomes a mental faculty of an adult, like being, no, it's, it's just kind of like, um, so alcohol. where to, so adults Why are then to the point to of maturity that now this becomes a supreme good. So yeah. the, these are the oh, things no, that I, like, I get what you're saying. So, yeah. you know, the, the, and, and I, what, what I always, what I go back to is to your question. Yeah. Oh man. We had that incredible time. Like, oh, Sheila, we're the best of friends now. Like, it oh my awesome. God. And dude, like, Floyd like, oh, man, we're going to totally forget that tomorrow. Absolutely. <laughs> like, you know, where, you know what? If I entered into your, the depths of your soul and your yeah. suffering and I'm there with you and I, and I went out to the point of your suffering and, and this is what happened to me here and you're emoting and I'm there with you empathically and I'm compassionately entering into your suffering, yeah. that's going to create a hell of a lot more impact, yeah. impact and, and bond than me saying, hey, bro, man, your life screwed up. My <laughs> life screwed up. Hey, man, like now we have a bond. Right. Now we have a bond. Like that's not that's not it. That's right. Yeah. So it goes back to that principle. Is there a better way to achieve yes, the desired right. yes. outcome? That's, that's right. it. That's Is exactly there a better right. way to achieve the outcome of being closer with your children, having calmer conversations Without. than taking a gummy? Right. Drinking there. chamomile tea. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's my so style. Cool, man. Yeah. Why or, do you think I got that sleepy time tea, that chamomile tea, the ginger tea, <laughs> or prayer, or mastery over bags. your emotions? <laughs> Or <laughs> mastery over your emotions. That's you know, right. There's that could always be another, there's, there yeah. is better ways yes. to do it. So is it always a grave moral sin to smoke a little weed? I don't think so. I don't either. I don't think so. But I, it's probably a venial sin when it borders on denial or a purposeful darkening of the intellect I, or yeah, the will. I, I know both people. People who smoke it. They, it's not out in the open. It's actually not even conversed about. Uh, discovered it another way, and then I've got friends who like it's just like that's all they do. I still, I just still think it's a slippery slope, and I think it it's, certainly is. And, it really and, is. And if it is a slippery slope, there has to be inherently, even when it seems, it's like Saint Ignatius's treatment of the angel of darkness that clothes itself with light. It's like yeah. this artificial light mm -hmm. that draws you in. It's like, oh, it's God. It's good. Mm -hmm. But then the movement through that relationship inherently, it is evil. And then the fruits of it do not provide what the heart desires. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like I still will hold until somebody comes up with a, a very convincing argument for me. And and I, I've experienced it. I've lived it. I've walked through it. I walk with people through it. You know, I've inhaled it. I've inhaled. I've, I've, done, I've, done, I've done that and much more. Yeah, like I've, I've, I've been, inhaled. I've been down the street. I've been in the middle of the project, and I mean, I've been. He's still Richie from the every, block. Yes. So <laughs> yes, yes. I will hold the morality, even if it could potentially be grave, may be open to venial, depending. But we have become so addicted to everything in the created order as being my solution to my problems. I go yeah. to the doctor and he prescribes me something on a pill box that I can't even pronounce or understand. And this is going to help me. So I eat it every single day. Like we've become so lazy. Yeah. In, in, in coming to know ourself, that's what St. Augustine expressed. He's like the first priority and the most important thing that we can do as a human being is come to know yourself. Back to what you were sharing mm -hmm. before. Yeah. You got to come to know yourself. And from that place, 
exploring before God in prayer with the goods that he's provided, he has provided you the ability to come to a deeper rooted position that I have purpose, I have meaning, I have value, I am loved, I am achieved, and I am called to greatness. And I'm not going to measure my greatness in light of anybody else. I'm not going to measure my greatness in light of Howard, my beard, and in light of Howard's you beard. Can. I can't. He's got a more beautiful beard than I do, but I'm okay with my beard. You guys may make fun of my old Through the beard. grace of God and Through not the grace marijuana. Of God. Yes. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but again, I think I think you're hitting it directly on is, is there better alternatives That's to it. the things that they achieve? That's the conversation. So, there. so I think I've got two great alternatives for some of the things that we've talked about, right? Yes. So prayer. Prayer. What is a great Fasting. way to relax? Prayer. Relaxing. What's a great way to find... Um, instead of drinking together, finding fraternity together. Uh, that's prayer together, right? Yeah. That's um, fasting together. And Exodus 90 is a great program for men to achieve a lot of these things that you can, you know, kind of cut corners and get through weed or, or alcohol and in a kind of cheap go. version. Fraternity. Fraternity. Prayer, prayer fasting, and asceticism. Fraternity. And that is the better lot, right? It is better to, hey, I could kind of talk to people if I smoke weed, or I could really fast from the things that are dulling my senses and really get to know myself and talk to each other. Um, yeah, the bond that you create in Exodus 90 or any of the Exodus programs. So we definitely encourage you go to Exodus90.com or go to CatholicTalkShow.com forward slash Exodus. Exodus. Yeah. And, you know, there you're going to be able to link up with this incredible movement for you to be able to form excellent bonds with people. The, yeah. the outcome of doing Holy a program bonds. like Holy that, bonds, yeah, yeah, like 90 days of ascetical life and and suffering together. When you suffer with somebody, you create a bond for life. Look at the the fruits of war. You yeah. know, when somebody you're in you're in warfare with something, that bond is is deeper than blood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean we we talked about this, you know, the the need for a man to share a struggle or a, a just to, to walk with another man yeah. mm -hmm. uh, is so important because how many how many men in your life at work or even at church really care about that part. You know, some people don't like to share, and I get it, uh, but a lot of people uh, are extremely helped by sharing some of their struggles. It's yeah, like yeah. Thomas Mert, like no man is an island. Yeah, there's you know, no such thing. No, yeah. and, and Exodus helps to break down those barriers, break mm -hmm. down those separations, and create and facilitate an environment where, you know, you may have grown up with a dad that didn't give a crap about what you were, what right. you were going through. Yeah. You know, that's okay, but every person... To thrive, to truly thrive, mm -hmm. you have to be a person in community. Yeah. JP2 talked about it. Uh, Norris Clark talked I mean, like, there's some great philosophers out there who explain that the fulfillment of our humanity is founded in our ability to share that vulnerability with another. Yeah, mm -hmm. And and that's outside of the bonds of marriage. You know, we need to have sorority and fraternity where we share and we're calling each other to holiness. And, and that is fulfilling. And Exodus knocks it out of the park. You know, or maybe let's say, for example, you might be somebody who does lean on these crutches of, say, weed or marijuana or other substances, and you really want to try to refocus yourself and find a better way. The abstinence and the ascetic practices of Exodus 90 are really yes. great for that. And there's your alternative there's to try. a better alternative right. to I mean, try with an open heart. That's right. So Exodus has a program for 90 days, almost like a boot camp, to break you of your addictions, yeah. to get you reoriented, reoriented, and then they have ongoing programs to help maintain you day to day beyond that first 90-day period or however you enter in. And so, allow me to give a testimony, though, too. Like, <coughs> you know, for me, if I didn't have Holy Mother Church governing my ascetical life by Advent and Lent and now doing more of like that 90-day treatment of leading up to Christmas, 90-day mm -hmm. treatment leading up to Lent, you know, and, and having these patches of, of ascetical practices and entering more deeply into poverties of all sorts, like if I didn't have Holy Mother Church calling me to that, but I'd be lost. And yeah. to be truthful, I struggle when I'm living in excess and I'm relaxing my disciplines. It's like my appetites just begin to take That's over my it. body. Then I, I gain 20 pounds or I gain 15 pounds. I feel unhealthy. My heart yeah. is heavy. I have yeah. headaches. I have chronic pain. I'm tired. Uh, tired, yeah. exhausted. Like depression. Not, yeah, like depression. Yeah. All of that stuff is affected by what I'm putting into my world. body. Yeah, the created, the created world. world yeah, because I'm making comfort. And, and that 
that's where, you know, like people struggle. I don't know what sin is. I can't confess. I, I don't know how to approach confession. You know, honestly, I always start with the first and the last commandment. The first commandment, I am the Lord your God. You shall not have any other gods before me. And then a lot of us just kind of glance over that and be like, oh, I don't worship Baal. I don't worship like this false God. No, like we make the created order our gods. Mm -hmm. You know, and and we can identify like, yeah, man, I sink a lot more of my fulfillment in NFL football or, or yeah, NBA just look basketball. At your time. Or look at your time. Just look at your time. You'll where find, are you storing up your treasures? You'll find your where, boy. You'll find your love. You'll find your honor. You'll find your praise. You'll find your glory. Mm -hmm. Look at where you spend Amen. your time. Amen. Pope Benedict the Sixteenth. You will know that for which you worship, for that for which you make time. Oh, when you, you look yeah. at when you look at your clock, when you look at your timepiece, you're gonna know what you're worshiping. And and when you dispose yourself to a daily habit of prayer, that's why for Catholics, it's not like we fulfill an obligation just by coming to Mass on Sunday and then we're good before God. No, it it, it starts our week out. And how does it start our week out? By turning our eyes to the Father through Christ our Lord. Amen. That needs to be a repetitive behavior Sunday to Sunday, to Sunday, to leading to the eternal Sunday, the eighth day of eternity. Yep. Yeah, you said it yesterday when we were filming another show. You said, when you wake up, Lord, open my lips and my mouth will proclaim your praise. And usually I wake up, I'm like, oh, Baldy, or whatever. <laughs> and, and the first thing I did this morning was like, Lord, open Amen, my lips bro. and let my mouth Amen, proclaim bro. your praise. Amen. And and that kind of set me off into, Amen. okay, let me do some prayers. And yeah. Like, and let me tell you, like, and this is why I love praying with my breviary as opposed to my phone, yeah. because like the, the, and I don't even have my phone right now. I'm, oh, there it is. <laughs> yeah. But like, as opposed to like, here's a message. Here's 15 messages. Yeah. Here's emails. And then I'm going to try to find my way yeah. to the prayer app, iBrievery, which yeah. I highly recommend. It's great to have as a backup. It's, yeah. iBrievery. Said contra. But, but, yeah. It, <laughs> once, but once I, once I, you know, and, and now I have it memorized. So I just kind of lay there and I do it. Yeah. Um, and I have Psalm 95 memorized. Thanks be to God. And I can interiorize that without even opening up my phone. That's great. Um, but yeah, that's that's the thing. And it's like the temptation is, it's like, let me just, and I do, I have done this so many times. Open it up, emails, text messages, yeah. social media. And then I'm looking through all of this stuff. Who has reached out to me? And I'm making other people gods. I'm making other people more important than God, my father. So, mm -hmm. you know, and that, I think that goes to each and every one of us, you know, like to really dispose yourself and open your day with prayer because he has the plan for your fulfillment. Yeah. More no that, form of uh, drug, substance, <laughs> entertainment, or any other type of social communication does. Right. One, one of the reasons why I um, got rid of Facebook, I didn't get rid of it because we work on it or whatever, but one of the reasons why I don't use it was because I'm like... 98% of these people I'm never going to see in person again. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's great that they know I have kids or if they're successful or I had a good dinner or mm -hmm. whatever. I, I would love to preach the word of God there, you know, all this stuff. But at the end of the day, I have so many meaningful connections, primarily with God, yeah. right? It's like, you know, I'm, I'm giving time to these people when I could literally just open up scripture and connect to my God, yeah. which will feed me so I can feed the people around me. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Like to me, that's the, the kind of tipping point is I, I ask myself, like, what am I doing here? Yeah. What do I hope to accomplish? Mm -hmm. Am I interested in these people's lives? Yeah. But is it a priority? Should it be a priority? Yeah. No. You know, you can be driven into all these communications as primarily, utterly, gutterly a distraction. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's using other people's lives as entertainment. You're not really entering into their lives for, out of goodwill. You're just looking at their lives as a mindless entertainment. And that's right. that's a real it's detriment. Like voyeurism or something. It, voyeurism, that's really that's a what great it is. Point. Yeah. And then it becomes exhibitionism of other people. Or you, yourself. Should you be sharing your kid's report card on social media so some stranger you went to high school can give you a like? Absolutely not. That's tacky. <laughs> yeah. It's weird. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My wife really, <laughs> my wife got off of social media real early, mm -hmm. and she, Kelly, really has a great perspective on why are people doing these kinds of things? And again, Even like Catholics are like, look at where I am. I'm at the Vatican, or I'm like with this famous Catholic or... 
you know, it's just like, man, pick up the phone and call your real friends. Yeah. <laughs> Share oh, your be excitement. Present in the moment. Be be present in the yeah, be present in the moment. We were laughing about we were watching a football game. It was like Monday night, and this guy's like in like <laughs> on the end zone, man. And and he's like looking through his phone and filming something. And the guy runs right up to him and sits on the thing. And I'm going, Your arms, you couldn't even hug the guy. Like that. How freaking cool would that have been? And yeah. he's just like, he's like literally smiling yeah. like this, you know, yeah. like I got this on. Golly, man. Yeah. Like, wow. I, I just, it's such a depravity of like, what's it's 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 just a depravity you know of human life because and and back to like the addictiveness of it like i could be here yeah or i could be here and it's like i've and and my happiness and and this is why i love doing the show with the you know the four of us you know with howard included um because it gives us opportunities to just enter into our friendship and enter into a good yeah. conversation. Mm-hmm. And we're blessed that you're a part of the conversation week in and week out, and we hope that it benefits you. But the only way that it benefits you is not in this exchange of just kind of listening, but but to do that with your family, your friends, your small groups. We have so many small groups around different churches and even some of uh, the kids in their, in their classrooms with their teachers, like their mm-hmm. teachers share our content. This might be one of the shows that, that yeah. you know, kids definitely need to be kids considering like weed. teenagers like yeah. do it. it's like you know I, I think it's really important to have these conversations and be honest about it not be judgmental or puritanical about it like look we've all had our mistakes we all have our history we all have our past but the idea is like learning like no God's path is going to be the one that Really, the roots man. parallel universe, man. <laughs> you gotta get there, bro. You gotta live in the now, uh, man. In the now. <laughs> you know uh, I, that's a great point. And for all you people who are in, engaging with us through a screen, there's some ways that you can engage with us more closely and on a deeper level. So one of the things that we do for our patrons is that we have, you know, personal yeah. hangouts with them, where we get to talk to them individually, ask them their feedback on the show, get insights from them. Ask them Share what, our lives with each yeah, other. Exactly. You know, we've got a guy there. It's got had a seminarian. It's now become a priest. I mean, just so many beautiful people with wonderful stories that you don't have questions about their faith. Yeah. You yep. know, and, and the trips that we've taken, the hangouts, like in, in person. person yeah. Like, yeah. there's so many things that we've done with our Patreon. You know, and and I think those are the things that I love the most because I think it was it's moral, entering more intentional into relationships. And this is this is exactly what we're talking about. Yeah. Is like we don't want to be some guys in some show behind a screen if possible we'd love to meet you yeah Yeah. you know what i mean yeah i mean i would say it was a moral good to have a couple beers with our patrons Mm -hmm. when we hung out that was fun that was really a blast and we have more things to come so if you're out there considering being a patron of the show and a financial supporter we truly need it because we have goals in the future to continue to expand our reach and to expand our quality so that does all cost and bringing in guests and making sure that our studio is up to date and and you know it does have a cost to it. So go to catholictalkshow.com forward slash Patreon. You're going to see every way that you could support us financially. And we've got incredible gear, top level coffee cups, top the level. most comfortable hoodies. I mean, this keeps my coffee. I had this yesterday. It's still warm. <laughs> oh, no, don't do that. That's gross. <laughs> oh, you just drink a day of coffee. Terrible. I'm going to go back to my yeah, there you my go. Coffee That looks here. like a bowl. Yeah, go to catholictalkshow.com forward slash Patreon. You can do soup in this You can find all different ways, different tiers to support us. We're not asking for your rent money. We're asking for your pocket change. And it really helps us continue this show and it's really your way that you can participate on a more deep level. Yeah, it truly does help. So to our patrons out there, thank you so much for supporting us. Thank for you. those on the fence, just simple. Go to CatholicTalkShow.com forward slash Patreon. P-A-T-R-E-O-N. So Patreon. I think let's sum up this episode. Is it okay to smoke weed? Nope. Eh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Under very, 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 maybe. very you know, and I think, you know, so it's discern, really yeah, discern with an and, open And it heart. takes real discernment, but it's not a subjective discernment, yeah. right? It's yeah. like, it's something that should be discerned communally mm-hmm. with your a medical professional, Please. with, uh, you know, with somebody that loves you, that knows you, mm-hmm. you know, is this a good for you? Talking to, you know, somebody that you look up to, Snoop. a mentor, a guide, you know, like not looking at influencers to guide your life, but looking at people who truly have a relationship with you yeah. and love you yeah. because they're going to be the ones to say like how many of us are like oh bro I could I could down like 18 beers in the you know and and it's like you know and What's I can still tell hold you? it together you know like I'm a man you know like that's how we grew up uh-huh. we're idiots <laughs> we think like 
Oh, I, I, I do it moderately, and I, it, it makes me feel, you know, because I'm an adult, but I don't share it with my children. Like, no, no, that's wrong. That's wrong. But I'm doing it myself, and I'm, like, I'm okay because I'm a man. And You know, it's yeah. like uh, the stupidity of that logic is just, you know. But anyway. I think a good way to sum it up, like Ephesians 5.18. This is great. Do not get drunk with wine or get high with weed. That's an addendum by me. For that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit, because that is your fulfillment. There and you then go. on top of that, look at this. Do not get drunk with wine or get high with weed. It's impossible to not get high. Yeah. yeah. Impossible. It is impossible. But you could take a simple simp sip of wine and not get drunk. Right. Well, to I don't know, point. some of the dirty weed that you Think buy in Cleveland, that. you yeah. can smoke that all day and not get anything. It's got great spray. <laughs> yeah, like, great spray. Great spray. Yeah, that, great. that Lake County Brown, man, I don't do nothing. <laughs> yeah. I don't want that. I think we all know where Father Rich stands <laughs> on the subject. <laughs> well, my brothers and sisters, it's always a joy here at the Catholic Talk Show. We do hope that you enjoyed this show. Make sure, if you didn't get a chance, subscribe on our platforms, follow us on the social media channels, but most importantly, give us a thumbs up. Put some comments in the comments section. It pushes it out to new communities in the algorithm on YouTube or any of the other shows. Give us some likes on uh, iTunes and Spotify and continue to spread the good news of the Catholic Talk Show. We're here every single week talking about wonderful things just like this. But before we go our separate ways, you know, more seriously, there are so many people out there that have died from fentanyl. There are so many people that have died because of an opioid addiction, and it is a crisis in the world today. This is something that the world, as as a people, we as a people, need to address and come up with creative plans to reach those who are truly in need and isolated and subject to the slavery of addiction. And we have to work very hard and labor in the name of God and his kingdom to reach out to these people who are suffering these extreme forms of poverty. We'd like to share with you one of our patron saints uh, that we came in touch with uh, a while back, and St. Mark G. Tian Zhang. And, you know, he was a Chinese lay devout Catholic and a doctor, and he was martyred during the B Boxer Rebellion. He was canonized in 2000 by our boy, St. John Paul II. And he was an opioid ad addict. Yeah. And if you have an opioid addict in your life to turn to Mark G. Tian Zhang, in, and to look him up in his story, his story and testimony is extremely powerful. So check the show notes because Shield's going to put uh, his story up and pray through his intercession uh, for those that are suffering in your life. And our sincere condolences, our sincere condolences goes out to you if you've lost someone to an opioid addiction or fentanyl. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of great resources out there. You know, go look them up. There's addiction helplines. Yes. There's things for um, opioid addiction. There's things for alcohol addiction. AA help was help created by a, a nun. There's a lot of things out there. There's um, uh, Saint Mart Matt Talbot if you're struggling with alcohol, mm -hmm. whatever. But you got to deal with this stuff all the time, and I'm sure you're seeing the heartbreaking effects of it. Yeah, and and that's why it is at the top level of my my pastoral care through Community Chinacolo. So a big shout out to Comunita. Community Chinacolo, C E N A C O L O, Chinacolo. Um, because, you know, it, we have to make that type of community life in every place. And, you know, we see great success when we walk with God and we employ behavioral therapy. There's great outcomes. And, you know, it, my heart does go out to people who have suffered loss. And on behalf of the Catholic Talk Show, each and every one of us, we've experienced it, but we offer you our condolences and we suffer with you if you have lost somebody from a fentanyl or opioid overdo overdose. Um, or any other substance. Or any other, other substance. You know, our hearts go out to you. So let us pray through the intercession of St. Mark, Jeezy, and Zhang, and Our Lady, as we just pray that we continue to respond well and be disciplined along the path that God wills for our fulfillment and life. St. Mark, Xi, Zian, Zhang, pray, for, pray us. for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. And we'll see you next week.